To indoctrinate boys into the rules of patriarchy, we force them to feel pain and to deny their feelings. Hip-hop has long established itself as the preeminent cultural force in our world. It is not just a genre of music, but in the words of Derek Hyde for Hampton Think, an extremely multifaceted cultural phenomenon. This cultural phenomenon has allowed for global audiences to explore their own free expression, connect with different cultures, and gain some insight into the struggles and expressions of black Americans. However, as we study and celebrate hip hop as fans and participants, we must also take a critical lens to it. Decades of debates and discourses have tackled the subject of misogyny in hip hop, something so firmly a part of the cultural force that even in its most healing and connective moments, it struggles to shake off. Often we attach these negative ideas of gender in hip hop to easy targets. Gangsta and drill rappers whose work is seen as lowbrow and whose transgressions are bold to the point of celebration. We focus heavily on the marginalization of female rappers and their contributions both within the music and around it. But these important yet simplified subjects individualize and minimize the problem, which is systemic and can be seen even in the careers of hip hop's most hallowed artists. Case in point is Kendrick Lamar. An artist from Compton who broke out in 2010 with the mixtape Overly Dedicated, a personal favorite. Kendrick has been hailed as the star of his generation and one of the greatest rappers of all time, not only because of his technical skills and his bona fide hit making, but for his ability to merge these different musical sensibilities and bring them into a singular, powerful, artistic vision. One that lands him Hot 100 number one hits, Time Magazine lists, and for 2017's Damn, a Pulitzer Prize in music. Songs like Sing About Me and All Right demonstrate Kendrick's poignancy as a writer and musician and help lend him the status of being a savior type figure in hip hop, an artist who emerged during a time that many felt the music felt watered down and led it to new ground with a humble conscience and a hyperactive brain. But Kendrick's lyrics have not been absent of outright misogyny, even if they're not usually the type to be seen as egregious by today's standards. Verses on records like Fucking Problem and For Free Interlude can raise an eyebrow or two, but it's Kendrick's past support for late rapper XXXTentacion, a known abuser of women, and he and his label stance rejecting censorship of abusers like him on streaming platforms that helped ignite chatter of the artist harboring a problematic outlook on the expendability and safety of women. Of course, a lot of these issues blend with the nuances of protecting black men from segregation at the hands of large corporations like Spotify, and observing the internalization of trauma with people from poor, difficult backgrounds. Moreover, records like These Walls and Keisha's song show the other side of the coin for Kendrick, his ability to speak up for women and women's rights. His recent appearance at Glastonbury and the moment he had towards the end of the concert was another example of that. But this dissonance and many other dissonances like it apparently led to Kendrick's self-interrogating breakdown on his new album Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers, a project released like all of his work to great critical acclaim, but also uniquely great scrutiny towards controversial and ambiguous lyrics about a number of subjects. A lot of that was about track 15, Auntie Diaries, and whether or not it adequately tackled the subjects of homophobia and transphobia. It's a lot of conversations about who the songs are for, are they for the marginalized communities that he's speaking about treating better, or is it towards the audiences of people that historically don't treat them better, and if that's the case, based on this direction, what was the best method? Was this the best method? Could it have been better? Was it effective? Yeah, a whole lot of things that I, you know, I'm gonna kind of let other people decide since they're smarter and more qualified than me to speak on that. The record's full of controversy and discourse and it's probably one to be debated for years. There's no doubt that it contains a level of introspection and cultural commentary that is extremely honest and self-critical and that a lot of the record could be appreciated for that, but there's also some valid doubt as to how much Kendrick is growing in the right direction and how positively it depicts that growth overall. With that said, I want to return to the subject of misogyny and gender overall to talk about one particular standout track from Mr. Morale, which is Father Time. A song which features British singer Sampha, another personal favorite, and comes in at track number 5, in the midst of a highly confrontational and emotional first disc. Now, I feel like when we talk about misogyny in hip hop or in any cultural movement, in any sense of our culture, we have to talk about it with an understanding that misogyny is not merely a reflection of poor morals from bad people, but a consequence and an intended consequence of patriarchy 
which can be defined as a systemic inequity which concentrates power and strength in the hands of men and dictates to men how they must conduct themselves in order to earn and maintain such power, earn, which ultimately leads to the oppression of all people from all identities but also especially leads to a hierarchical order in which, in terms of the concentration of power and wealth in society, men are at the top. In Father Time, we see how patriarchy, both in the literal familial sense and the social systemic sense, imprisons young men like Kendrick Lamar within extremely unhealthy habits. It's a harrowing look at how Kendrick, ultimately fond and appreciative of his father and the memories they shared, recognizes how destructive many of his father's teachings and behaviors were to his mental health. And the result is something which just about anyone who has experienced manhood can relate to and take something positive from. So in this video, I'll analyze the lyrics of Father Time with some help from the writings of scholar and activist Bell Hooks, particularly from her book, The Will to Change, Men, Masculinity, and Love, to illustrate how patriarchy ultimately leads to the destruction of men, even powerful, famous, and socially conscious men like Kendrick Lamar. In the conclusion, I'll zoom out to talk about how relevant this theme is to a greater society in 2022 and to you, the viewer, with the hopes of learning some actionable steps to help us all heal from the destruction of patriarchy and help to break it down in our own lives. All right, that was a great introduction. It was only five hours long, so let's get into it. Father Time begins with dialogue between Kendrick and his longtime partner, Whitney Alford. She tells him, you really need some therapy. To which he responds, Real nigga need no therapy, no, what are you talking no. about? Now this is a very straightforward way of approaching the themes of mental health in Mr. Morale, which is a key theme for understanding how harmful patriarchy is in the lives of men. The damage it does to our mental health informs our decision making, which is often destructive to ourselves and others. This inspires folks, often non-male folks like Whitney's character, to implore men to get therapy, to which many men, still trapped in that poisonous decision making, instinctively respond with disgust, asserting that they're too manly for it. That such a choice would be an affront to their manhood. A meta-analysis of multiple studies on masculine norms, mental health, and social functioning by Wang et al. found that, quote, conformity to masculine norms was significantly and positively related to negative mental health, as well as significantly and negatively related to positive mental health, unquote. Now this line is cited as one of Kendrick's favorites in a talk he did with Spotify as well. Because that's how niggas feel, you know what I'm saying? We grew, we grew up with... Our parents don't know about that, our grandparents don't know about that. You, you live and you experience the shit that you go through and you deal with it right then and there, or you don't never deal with it. We learn to hold all that shit in. Shit, we keep 100 with you. That wasn't my forte when people mentioned it to me. You know, I'm, I'm still stuck. Uh, my pops think fucking need therapy for to challenge myself to go to therapy. Shit, that's like a whole new step in a whole new generation. It's a growth. Okay, that's just the first two seconds of the song. Let's try to keep going. The next, two f <laughs> the next few lines see Whitney dismiss Kendrick's dismissiveness, imploring him to reach out to famed therapist and author Eckhart Tolle. She says, Kendrick sounds stupid as fuck. To which Kendrick says, shit, everybody's stupid, which is a type of deflection tactic that avoids self-reflection by critiquing other people. Well, other people are stupid. Everybody's stupid, so stop. As the song begins, Kendrick says, I come from a generation of home invasions and I got daddy issues, that's on me. Here, Kendrick begins by telling the audience that he has lived a life of tremendous unsafety and trauma in inner city Compton. However, given the introduction showing his unwillingness to seek help, one may at first take this as a sign he's going to deflect from admitting his own faults and vulnerabilities by simply justifying himself through his negative experiences. That behavior is common among people struggling to take accountability. In particular, as FD Signifier notes in his recent video, Connecting the Manosphere, it can be seen in the manifestos of male incel mass shooters in the US, who often place blame on greater society for making them this way. But the second half of this line holds a significant eschewing of expectations in two ways. For one, Kendrick self-assigns as having daddy issues a term often used diminutively about women who have difficult relationships with their fathers. That idea of daddy issues also derives from Freud's idea of the father complex, which describes the behaviors and impulses of people who have a negative relationship with their father. 
thus making it a type of term that would be seen as emasculating for a lot of men. Maybe we might say we don't have daddy issues, but you know, maybe our dads were like, distant or like we didn't see eye to eye. No, Kendrick says daddy issues. Secondly, Kendrick concludes the line by saying that's on me, which is a groundbreaking thing to say in this context. Of course, the fact that Kendrick has been born to such circumstances is not his fault, but in saying that's on me, he recontextualizes his traumas as part of his own personal journey that he has to do the work to deal with rather than a mere justification for his actions. This is something anyone struggling with their circumstances can take note of. Next, Kendrick says, everything them four walls had taught me made habits buried deep. Which further explains how his circumstances caused him to take on negative habits and ideas. Note how much like his previous works like Institutionalized, the allusion to four walls metaphorically kind of makes the connection to the idea of imprisonment with something that occurs in everyday life. Kendrick follows by speaking on his father's strengths and eventual shortcomings. That man knew a lot, but not enough to keep me past them streets. In the fourth bar, Kendrick notes how much of a person's life and being is strongly influenced by forces practically impossible to pin down. My life is a plot twisted from directions that I can't see. In the next four bars, Kendrick then explains how his father would discipline him violently with abstract parallels to sports in which traditional masculine ideas of strength, competitiveness, and dominance are trained and explored by young men being presented with these patriarchal ideas and realities. He says, Daddy issues all across my head. Tell me fuck a foul. I'm teary eyed. Wanna throw my hands. I won't think out loud. A foolish pride. If I lose again, won't go in the house. I stayed outside laughing with my friends. They don't know my life. Note the multiple meanings of ball across my head, with ball being an early reference to sports like basketball, which is referred back to with the phrase fuck a foul, connoted with condoning rough play, as well as potentially ball as in balling up a fist, referring to his father's fist punching a young Kendrick across the head, as well as ball being a term for crying, meaning the daddy issues manifesting as tears Kendrick releases balling across his head. Those are kind of some some thoughts I had on that. The sports imagery evokes ideas of the presence of sports for young black men in the inner city as an omnipresent stomping ground to assert dominance, perform masculinity, and in some cases escape poverty. This is one of those realities that a lot of rappers have spoken about. You either play ball or you rap or you go to jail, right? Like that's a lot of what a lot of rappers from Kanye West to, to Nas have spoken about. I think that there's an important connection there. It's also this important connection with this neoliberal idea that you have to work really hard. And if you didn't get out of your circumstance, that's just because you didn't seize the opportunity. You weren't ruthless, you weren't competitive enough. And sports is like a perfect encapsulation of that. Anybody who wins in sports, well, you're, you're the person who was better, you were stronger, you were more determined. And that's sort of one of the key patriotic ideas. We're gonna get to the bell hooks in a second by the way. I just wanted to go over some of these first parts. It's worth noting that black men are the subject and the audience of the song in a particular way that I of course can't articulate and I want to amplify their voices rather than glorify mine. I definitely want to bring FD Signifier's commentary on this particular song here. I resonated with and I didn't even really grow up with my father but like that's about just like the the projections of black masculinity that like primitive function that is instilled in us, especially as black men, that says we, we're, the world does not have the capacity for empathy or patience with you. So I, as your dad, am not going to give that to you. So you get your ass up and you get back out there. My father had that same conversation about not trusting people. Them same conversations about women that like I had to unlearn and unpack over the course of my life. And my father was an educated black man, went to college, like all the, all the things you think you know, especially you get this bourgeoisie black excellence um, stuff in your system, you think, oh, we're evolved beyond that. And like, no, like that, that prescription of black masculinity surviving it within this world, that's a key feature. I don't care what your bank account says. I also want to note how in this talk about sports and in this talk about being punished for losing, it begins the sore loser motif that becomes a key part of the song's themes and also relates a key part of Kendrick's learned and performed masculinity, relatable to most if not all men living under patriarchy. As Bell Hooks writes, Patriarchy is a political social system that insists that males are inherently dominating, superior to everything and everyone deemed weak, especially females, and endowed with the right to dominate and rule over the weak and to maintain that dominance through various forms of psychological terrorism and violence. 
the sore loser is a trait and a social phenomenon that arises in people who are highly upset by losing contests of different kinds. Sore losers are bred by capitalism, and they are often male or male-coded because of patriarchy. Why? Well, the man's role in society is meant to be one of conquest, a person who takes on challenges and succeeds at them, who rejects failure, who refuses to accept failure. And in fact, a person who is dominant has to include the failure or sublimation of other people in their dominance. These are ideas we inherit from European imperialism. As imperialists justified their crimes against humanity in pillaging, massacring, and stealing land and resources from other peoples by describing it as a noble act of victory, justified by their superior drive, intellect, and strength. See Manifest Destiny, see the conquistadores, etc. When we as men play sports with such a drive to not only succeed but to dominate other people, to humiliate them, and to cement ourselves as better than them, for no other reason other than the sake of competition, we define competition as inherently patriarchal in this manner and ultimately toxic, a concept based on a lie made to convince people that some men are simply superior to others. In the 8th bar, Kendrick follows his father's orders to stay outside, which can be interpreted as his punishment for losing. Outside, he maintains affability and cool-headedness among his friends, laughing with them as if everything is okay, which is aided by the fact that they don't know his life, so he's able to put that cover on. And this is another way in which he performs masculinity. You can't have bad things going on, you have to be strong, you have to be perfectly fine. The next few bars. Daddy issues made me learn losses. I don't take those well. Mama said that boy is exhausted. He said, go fuck yourself. If he give up now, that's gonna cost him. Life's a bitch. You could be a bitch or step out the margin. I got up quick. In this part, we see an embodiment of FD Signifier's account of fathers punishing their sons as failures with the same lack of empathy that they see that the world will treat them with. In that way, it's a feedback loop. Not only are fathers and men inheriting patriarchal ideas out of this idea that it's, it's how they were raised and so it's all they know, it's what they think is correct, but also as a response to the fact that the world does operate that way and so if it's going to operate that way, then they're going to try to train you as hard as possible to deal with that, whether or not it's pleasant. It's this disconnect between the idea of the world is messed up, so we should do something about it to make it less messed up, versus what a lot of people, maybe most people do, as a natural individualized reaction, which is to say the world's messed up, so you best be as prepared as possible no matter what. As Hooks says to start chapter three, which is titled Being a Boy, boys are not seen as lovable in patriarchal culture. Even though sexism has always decreed that boy children have more status than girls, status and even the rewards of privilege are not the same as being loved. Patriarchal assault on the emotional life of boys begins at the moment of their birth. Contrary to sexist mythology, in the real world of male and female babies, male babies express themselves more. They cry longer and louder. They come into the world wanting to be seen and heard. Sexist thinking at its worst leads many parents to let male infants cry without a comforting touch because they fear that holding baby boys too much, comforting them too much, might cause them to grow up women. Growing up wimpy is seen as especially unacceptable for men of marginalized ethnic backgrounds, especially black men, who are racialized by Western society as violent and intellectually inferior from their birth. The challenges black people must overcome in society lead many parents, especially fathers to their boys, to put forth as little empathy and as much struggle as possible with the aim of hardening these young boys. Again, a feedback loop. The use of the word bitch here denotes the inherent misogyny of this ideology, which is a big part of it. Within patriarchy, the woman's role is to be domicile, passive, and subordinate, particularly towards powerful men. The word bitch, which derives from a term describing young pregnant female dogs, dehumanizes women, although its modern usages often reappropriate the term to be a mere expletive or exclamation or a common term for a person with a bad personality. However, when the father says Kendrick can be a bitch or step out the margin, he is outlining the gender dichotomy. Either Kendrick can be passive, subordinate, and weak, thus feminine, a bitch, or he can step out the margin, like a man, thus bringing himself liberation through his own hard work and bravery, again confirming the neoliberal ideal. Desperate to avoid being weak and effeminate, to become strong and brave, and perhaps mostly to gain his father's approval, Kendrick gets up quick. 
Next, I'm charging baskets and falling backwards, trying to keep balance. Oh, this the part where mental stability needs talent. Oh, this the part he breaks my humility just for practice. Tactics we learn together. Sore losers forever. Daddy issues. This part can have multiple interpretations. To me, charging baskets and falling backwards is again a clever bit of wordplay that refers to basketball, sports, but with two potential contrasting meanings. The idea of charging to the basket, meaning an active and offensive player dribbling to the rim to finish in an emphatic, determined fashion, and falling backwards, which in that case would be potentially failing to score or taking a significant fall after charging to the basket, akin to the way like John Morant might do, would be evoking the image of sacrificing one's body out of this sheer determination to score. Now it could also refer to another basketball play, the act of taking a charge wherein a defensive player puts their body in a position to cause an offensive player to unfairly barge into them, thus causing an offensive foul. Usually doing this causes a defensive player to fall backwards, and it's usually seen as a sacrifice for the good of the team. But it's also not glorified the way scoring is, because it's a sacrifice that benefits the team, disrupts the game, and ultimately can look a bit ridiculous or painful, can look a bit weak. As Kendrick says he's trying to keep balance, it shows his difficult mental state balancing these thoughts with a parallel to the difficulties in trying not to fall backwards, either when driving to the rim or taking a charge, either when being the person fully assertive, trying to finish, trying to show a, a, a display of strength and determination, or taking one for the team, just biting the bullet for the sake of being successful. He then articulates on the balance by saying this is the part where mental stability needs talent, a potential reference to how one's mental instability is often seen as gold for making art. In the case of a hip hop artist like Kendrick, it could be that lyrics about dominating women and being violent are reflections of an unstable mind state, but they are also part and parcel of a rapper's image and credibility because it's their display of these patriarchal ideals. In similar fashion, he comments that this is the part he breaks my humility just for practice, which is a reference back to those unhealthy lessons from his father, which break his spirit for the sake of practice. Practice being a reference to sports, sure, but also practice as in preparing him for this cruel world. In the last line, tactics we learn together, there's a powerful unification there of his and his father's struggle. He has spent the verse writing of his father as a type of antagonist, causing Kendrick to grow up and feel a certain way. But it's here that he introduces the idea of his father learning with Kendrick, being another man side by side with him in this journey through life, who has also faced his own trauma and his own repression under these patriarchal ideals, and is merely imparting his knowledge and his love in the best way he sees fit as he grows older, mentoring his son. What Kendrick does here is an act of love that is revolutionary considering the father and son's opposition to each other under patriarchy, as described by Hooks. Patriarchal fathers cannot love their sons because the rules of patriarchy dictate that they stand in competition with their sons, ready to prove that they are the real man, the one in charge. A lot of what Kendrick says in this verse kind of resonates with this. It's this idea that instead of showing affection, instead of showing love and, and humane treatment toward his son, he's almost in competition with him, showing him, I am the stronger one, I am going to tell you what to do, and you have to be strong and put up with it. It's an inherent rivalry, a conflict that is supposed to be done as a ritual to keep the sun safe and make them grow, but ultimately is just another reflection of these patriarchal ideals, which are upheld by society, which are upheld by economics, that force these men to try to take up the standard so that they can be seen as worthy of the power that they are systemically being given. He then says sore losers forever, a phrase that acknowledges the sore loser status he inherited from his father's lessons, but in an almost celebratory manner. Again, giving a type of positive connotation to his father's actions while acknowledging their toxicity. And to close the verse, he repeats the term daddy issues. All that just makes up the first verse of the song, which has so many layers to peel at. The chorus also has its own standout layer of commentary performed by Samfa. Early morning wake ups, practicing on day offs, tough love, bottled up, no chaser, neat, no chaser, neat, no chaser. So in early morning wake ups, practicing on day offs, we get more sports imagery, showing the struggle of young men working extremely hard to get better 
at a sport, which is often celebrated as a type of glorified grind for athletes. And it's often a perfectly fine reflection of one's passion to improve and strive to succeed at a particular field. But in the context of the song, and in the context of the lives of a lot of young men who don't necessarily strive to become powerful athletes, it clearly contains a darker element of parental and patriarchal pressure. The phrase tough love is used rather importantly. Tough love is a phrase used to describe, quote, promotion of a person's welfare, especially that of an addict, child, or criminal, by enforcing certain constraints on them or requiring them to take responsibility for their actions. Now, tough love can be a great thing. There can be great positives towards supporting someone through constraining them or holding them accountable. But often the phrase tough love is just used to whitewash the inhumane and hurtful tactics people use to manipulate each other in relationships, including that of parents' harsh punishments and teachings towards their children. In the phrase bottled up, we first think of the idea of something being essentialized. Tough love bottled up can mean a distilled, strong form of tough love in a narrow, spatial package, like an essential oil. But alongside bottling up being a phrase to describe how people often bury their emotions inside them in unhealthy ways, which is a key part of the male experience that Kendrick describes, bottled up is also used as a bit of wordplay segueing into the next few lines. No chaser, neat a reference to how alcoholism, like many vices, develops as a way for people to escape their difficult emotions and bury them by indulging in escapist tendencies, including substance abuse. Alcoholism is one of the main toxic traits men use in society to deal with the trauma of their lives, often brought about by the dynamics of patriarchy that are being talked about in this song. According to the CDC, men are almost two times more likely to binge drink than women. Approximately 22% of men report binge drinking and on average do so five times a month, consuming eight drinks per binge. In 2019, 7% of men had an alcohol use disorder, compared with 4% of women. As we move into the second verse, off the back of the line tactics we learned together, we see Kendrick analyze his father's experience more and draw more comparisons between himself and his father. It begins with the two lines, I got daddy issues, that's on me, looking for I love you, rarely empathizing for my relief. After Kendrick reiterates his daddy issues and his personal responsibility, that's on me, his second line reflects in an ambiguous way what he had desired and what he potentially could have done better. For one, he acknowledges his looking for I love you, a feeling many people can relate to in their own daddy issues. Much of Hooks' writing in The Will to Change remarks on how seeking the love of one's father and the love of men in general is so strong a theme in many people's lives across the gender spectrum. No one hungers for male love more than the little girl or boy who rightfully needs and seeks love from dad. He may be absent, dead, present in body yet emotionally not there, but the girl or boy hungers to be acknowledged, recognized, respected, cared for. All around our nation, a billboard carries this message. Each night, millions of kids go to sleep starving for attention from their dads. Because patriarchal culture has already taught girls and boys that dad's love is more valuable than mother love, it is unlikely that maternal affection will heal the lack of fatherly love. No wonder then that these girls and boys grow up angry with men, angry that they have been denied the love they need to feel whole, worthy, accepted. Heterosexual girls and homosexual boys can and do become the women and men who make romantic bonds, the place where they quest to find and know male love. But that quest is rarely satisfied. Usually rage, grief, and unrelenting disappointment lead women and men to close off the part of themselves that was hoping to be touched and healed by male love. They learn then to settle for whatever positive attention men are able to give. They learn to overvalue it. They learn to pretend that it is love. They learn how not to speak the truth about men in love. They learn to live the lie. The love of a father is an uncommon gem, to be hunted, burnished, and hoarded. The value goes up because of its scarcity. As Kendrick says he was rarely empathizing for my relief, one wonders if he means empathizing with his own struggle, his own desire for love, or empathizing with his father, which not only would be a powerful and healing extension of love to him in the face of his struggle, but could present Kendrick with his own relief, which is often the case when we empathize, though not necessarily mend fences, with the people who hurt us. 
His next two bars present distinct, relatable imagery of the type of action Kendrick would do to gain his father's approval despite his struggles and pains. A child that grew accustomed, jumping up when I scraped my knee, cause if I cried about it, he'd surely tell me not to be weak. After this, he raps very clearly a theme of patriarchy that so often imprisons men to bury their feelings in the way the chorus describes. Daddy issues, hid my emotions, never express myself, men should never show feelings, being sensitive never helped. Of course the idea that men should never show feelings is a toxic one that men across the world now aim to deconstruct. However, it cannot be lost on us as men how this attitude is tied in with our attitudes about competition, work, and romance. As Hooks writes, the unhappiness of men in relationships, the grief men feel about the failure of love, often goes unnoticed in our society precisely because the patriarchal culture really does not care if men are unhappy. When females are in emotional pain, the sexist thinking that says that emotions should and can matter to women makes it possible for most of us to at least voice our heart, to speak it to someone, whether a close friend, a therapist, or the stranger sitting next to us on a plane or bus. Patriarchal mores teach a form of emotional stoicism to men that says they are more manly if they do not feel, but if by chance they should feel and the feelings hurt, the main response is to stuff them down, to forget about them, to hope they go away. In the next two lines, a standout reflection shows how Kendrick's father himself has been so weighed down by not only the patriarchal ideas of masculinity, but by the economic forces behind them. His mama died, I asked him why he going back to work so soon. His first reply was, son that's life, the bills got no silver spoon. Work and workaholism are highlighted and glorified as channels through which men can bury their emotions and something that consumes their time and energy, as well as gains them respectability as a part of society and the capital that they need in order to survive and or thrive. As Hux writes, Today's male worker struggles to provide economically for himself. And if he is providing for self and family, his struggle is all the more rigorous and the fear of failure all the more intense. Men who make a lot of money in this society and who are not independently wealthy usually work long hours, spending much of their time away from the company of loved ones. This is one circumstance they share with men who do not make much money but who also work long hours. Work stands in the way of love for most men then because the long hours they work often drain their energies. There is little or no time left for emotional labor, for doing the work of love. The conflict between finding time for work and finding time for love and loved ones is rarely talked about in our nation. It is simply assumed in patriarchal culture that men should be willing to sacrifice meaningful emotional connections to get the job done. No one has really tried to examine what men feel about the loss of time with children, partners, loved ones, and the loss of time for self-development. In the case of Kendrick's father, his struggle to feed his family is all the more threatened by his racialization in society and his class status. His ability to accept the simple fact of work being all important and emotional connections being an afterthought helps him accept work as an adequate vice for him to avoid the emotional difficulties of something like losing his mother. Many men use work as the place where they can flee from the self, from emotional awareness, where they can lose themselves and operate from a space of emotional numbness. Unemployment feels so emotionally threatening because it means that there would be time to fill, and most men in patriarchal culture do not want time on their hands. Kendrick's next four bars see him address the roots of his trust issues, also instilled by his father, not only in his father's words, but in his father's inability to give love. Daddy issues, fuck everybody, go get your money son, protect yourself, trust nobody, only your mom and them. This made relationships seem cloudy, never attached to none, so if you took some likings around me, I might reject the love. Then his next few bars show how he grows into his father's teachings, allowing him the mentality to become the success and hip hop icon he is, but also giving him pause as to how he views his peers and his life in general. Daddy issues kept me competitive. That's a fact, nigga. I don't give a fuck what's the narrative. I am that nigga. When Kanye got back with Drake, I was slightly confused. Guess I'm not as mature as I think. Got some healing to do. Those last bars drew attention for him publicly addressing the beef between Kanye and Drake. 
both of whom artists that he's worked with, one of whom he had beef with in Drake for a period of time. And that, that whole beef, of course, contains some seminal diss tracks, a seminal track by Pusha T, the story of Adidon. Then there was a viral verse by Drake on Sicko Mode. And then there was apparently a Too Far track that Drake almost dropped, but Jay Prince, the Houston CEO of rap lot had to stop him last minute. And then they eventually mended fences. In December of 2021, Kanye and Drake came together for a moment to perform at a joint concert at the LA Coliseum for the cause of freeing gang leader Larry Hoover and bringing awareness to prison reform. A great irony is revealed in this bar in that Kendrick, who has collaborated with Drake and Kanye in the past and was embroiled in a fairly ambiguous but well-discussed beef with Drake during the mid-2010s, has long been seen as their superior in terms of recent artistic achievement and in terms of socio-political consciousness, lyrical themes. And yet in this moment, Kendrick sees something admirable and foreign in how Drake and Kanye reconciled remarking on how his upbringing and the competitive spirit it fostered in him would not allow him to do such a thing, which could be so much more productive than grudge holding. This competitive spirit has long been hailed as a characteristic of rap, and often new school rap artists are maligned for lacking that kind of venom that their predecessors had, whether it be in battle rap, venues like Smack URL, or in public beefs like those between members of NWA or Nas and Jay-Z. This is also a talking point among basketball fans, the perception that rappers and hoopers these days are soft for not having interest in dominating and destroying their peers in competition and for being so publicly friendly with each other. And that's also an idea that's shaped in patriarchal ideas of competition. While vigorous competition can make for great achievement, it can also make for the destruction of people's lives, as can be seen in the great East Coast versus West Coast beef of the 90s. This is an important context for Kendrick now becoming so self-critical of such a beloved attitude among men, as seen in the next four bars. Egotistic, zero given fucks and to be specific need assistance with the way I was brought up. What's the difference when your heart is made of stone and your mind is made of gold and your tongue is made of sword but it may weaken your soul? Here, not only does Kendrick note the pitfalls of these mentalities and this obsession with being the strongest, self-strengthening, but he also entirely recontextualizes himself. Rather than being that guy and being competitive, he calls himself egotistic and actively asks for help. Then Kendrick remarks on the fatherless upbringing of his friends growing up, a common reality for people from marginalized backgrounds that is often deeply traumatizing and forces men and forces people from all backgrounds to learn these sordid ideas of masculinity from a variety of disconnected sources. My niggas ain't got no daddy. Grow up overcompensating, learn shit about being a man and disguise it as being gangster. Then he offers a salute to his father, a show of love again, in a song that's been pretty critical of him. I love my father for telling me to take off the gloves, cause everything he didn't want was everything I was. This line is so deep, it's so rich for interpretation. On one hand, it could be read as him showing a lot of appreciation to his father for molding him into this hard man. Him using the past perfect tense was allows for ambiguity rather than had been. In one reading, it can be seen as Kendrick saying he really was that kid in need of hardening, and then in the hardening, he became a lot stronger, and it was necessary. However, was is not a negation of is. And this can lead to another interpretation, which is that Kendrick is saying that he is still that person that his father didn't want him to be. Which explains how the previous line indicates that he truly does love his father. To not only love his father despite his ingrained hatefulness and the difficulties he had with him, but to declare love for his father is an act of rebellion against the very lovelessness his father tried to instill in him. Ultimately, despite his father's many attempts to make his son hard, to make Kendrick loveless, Kendrick is full of love and he's not afraid of coming off any type of way and showing that. Finally, Kendrick makes a declaration to his friends who cannot explicitly relate to the experience of being a father. And to my partners that figured it out without a father, I salute you. May your blessings be neutral to your toddlers. It's crucial. They can't stop us if we see the mistakes. Till then, let's give the women a break. Grown men with daddy issues. This reads as a message not only to men growing up fatherless, but to all men. We all have daddy issues, whether our dads were in our lives or not. And we can all overcome these issues and traumas by interrogating them and working to be our best selves so that the generation that follows us sees what we call blessings as neutral, as standard. 
His last line talks about fatherhood in perhaps the most crucial way, by acknowledging how our learned manhood, via patriarchy, inherently subjugates and destroys the lives of the women around us and how we owe it to them to give them a break. Again, facing head on this stigma often reserved to women through these mindsets. Okay, our current cultural landscape is so deeply entrenched in a war, not just between men and women, but between the patriarchy and those who are against it. Many of us feel that the patriarchal world we live in is not only impossible to change, but it's necessary and is in fact for the best. This is what fuels the success of thinkers like Jordan Peterson and podcasters like Joe Rogan. The former has built, as you the viewer are likely aware, a huge legion of fans with rhetoric that implores them to celebrate their traditional masculine traits and the traditional western world that breeds them. The fundamental assumptions of western civilization are valid. How about that? You know, it's not... You think it's an accident? Oh, here's how you find out, okay? Which countries do people want to move away from? Hey, not ours. Which countries do people want to move to? Ours. The big force that helps Peterson's words gain a sense of urgency and importance in his mind and in the mind of his audience, often disenfranchised men struggling with feeling unloved, feeling unaccepted, is the sense that there are these legions of authoritarian leftists trying to change the world too radically, trying to change the conventions and structures that supposedly make it so great. Male energy, male thinking, male energy is vilified. And you're, you're taught to think there's something wrong with being masculine. B being masculine is the reason why we don't speak German. Okay? Stop. Uh, exactly. Talk about toxic masculinity. You could you be the poster boy for that shit. Well, the whole reason why you need <laughs> male people is because there's male people other places that will take away your shit and kill your people and, and exactly. rape. Exactly. This is not a bad thing. Male does not equal evil. See, this is the problem with all this shit. Yes. It's demanding. They're trying to control people. They're telling people what to do and what not to do. And it's about power. A lot of this stuff is about power. All it's not of it about is. They're imposing their world view on, on you. But it's not even their worldview. It's not real. What it is is they're just deciding that this is a thing that they're going to agree to and they're going to force other people to comply. It's half the game. Half the game is just getting people to comply. Well, you do that by, and you start with language. You control yes. people's behavior through language, yes. which is the definition of political correctness. Yes. Well, that's what Carlin always said, that fascism is just political correctness with good manners. The Our political correctness is fascism with good, good manners. manners. Yeah. <laughs> which threatens these men and their insecurities, which are breeded by the system in the first place, because it takes away this thing that they can see as the channel through which they can overcome their problems, as this positive spin on this ultimately very dark dark reality they've been forced to live in. This idea is so tempting to, to fall into that if you just work really hard and if you're just stronger than everybody else, that you will not only have a lot of things, but you will also deserve all of your good things because you are the hard man, you are the strong man. And that you can have this as a set goal. Just improve yourself, just become strong, just work harder than everybody else. As if that's the place that you're gonna get to to be happy. As if happiness isn't something that you have to focus on in the present with wherever you're at. And it's not to say that working out more or cleaning your room can be extremely helpful. It's to say that it's held with this idea that you can just be this perfect man. And if you're not being this perfect man, well, gosh, you guess you just deserve to be wherever you're at because the way things are, are the way that they're supposed to be. They're the best version of the world that we live in. And even if it's difficult, you have to be strong and beat the difficulties. That's what makes great people. As long as you have that hope in your mind that you can be that great person, it's gonna be hard for you to accept that maybe that whole idea is messed up in the first place because not only is it not allowing you to be happy in the present, but it's also forcing you to take up these mindsets and these behaviors that oftentimes are very destructive, like being extremely toxic towards others, like being negative towards others, like not sharing your wealth, like only being happy with yourself and with other people when they fit a specific image of what they're supposed to look like, like not accepting love or not giving love because you're worried it's going to make you soft, it's going to make the person you love soft. And then when you're having all these loveless feelings, searching for somebody to just validate that actually the path you're on is perfectly fine because it'd be way harder for you to sit there and go, oh, I've been messing up this whole time. 
Peterson's great at channeling that, at really tapping into that to, to make people really have a hard time confronting themselves in that way. As Khalifa Sane writes for The New Yorker, Peterson has a way of making even the mildest pronouncement sound like the dying declaration of a political prisoner. His dramatics, often bringing him to tears or shouts, are well documented and leave him lambasted by left-wing critics who see the danger in his desire to uphold the patriarchy. But ironically, sometimes these left-wing critics are posited as part of that same patriarchy to the right-wing Petersons of the world. They are portrayed as heartless, unable to see his emotions, and also unwilling to acknowledge his apparently superior logic, which apparently proves that masculinity as we see it needs no adjustment, so it's perfectly fine. It's this argumentative trap that Peterson's critics, often young people from marginalized backgrounds, tired of the oppression that they face that's being at the hands of his rhetoric, most easily fall into because it's more cathartic and compelling to dunk on a person for looking silly, and if anyone needs catharsis and stimulation, it's the people that are going through the most shit in the first place. But Hux's discourses on feminism and the will to change underline to us how imperative it is that we focus on patriarchy as a system to dismantle for the betterment of everyone, including people like Peterson, rather than focus on the more nebulously narrow idea of sexism and this individualized idea of some people being the bad people. Not that some people aren't worse actors than others, but still. When contemporary feminism was at its most intense, many women insisted that they were weary of giving energy to men, that they wanted to place women at the center of all feminist discussions. Feminist thinkers like myself, who wanted to include men in the discussion, were usually labeled male-identified and dismissed. We were sleeping with the enemy. We were the feminists who could not be trusted because we cared about the fate of men. We were the feminists who did not believe in female superiority any more than we believed in male superiority. As the feminist movement progressed, the fact became evident that sexism and sexist exploitation and oppression would not change unless men were also deeply engaged in feminist resistance, yet most women were still expressing no genuine interest in highlighting discussions of maleness. It is no accident that feminists began to use the word patriarchy to replace the more commonly used male chauvinism and sexism. These courageous voices wanted men and women to become more aware of the way patriarchy affects us all. In popular culture, the word itself was hardly used during the heyday of contemporary feminism. Anti-male activists were no more eager than their sexist male counterparts to emphasize the system of patriarchy and the way it works, for to do so would have automatically exposed the notion that men were all powerful and women powerless, that all men were oppressive and women always and only victims. By placing the blame for the perpetuation of sexism solely on men, these women could maintain their own allegiance to patriarchy, their own lust for power. They masked their longing to be dominators by taking on the mantle of victimhood. Lots to unpack there. Now this is not me saying that dunking on Peterson or his followers or making fun of them is some sort of toxic violence to be avoided at all costs. It's often effective to make fun of people because it's fun. And though it's imperfect in its leanings, perfection is not something we should just always demand of ourselves, especially those of us who are already doing so much work to change ourselves and to try to change our world. However, there are two points I'd like to bring home here. For one, let's be conscious of what we want when we talk about and when we dunk on men, Petersonian or otherwise. Do we want to dismantle patriarchy or ascend its ladder? Do we want to dominate these men, these soft, silly men, to emasculate them and silence them? in the same ways men like Kendrick Lamar have talked about being taught to do since childhood, to a greatly damaging effect. I think critiques of Peterson, like that of Unlearning Economics' video on the gender pay gap, or critiques of Rogan, like Lonerbox's Joe Rogan and the Hard Men, do a great job of balancing entertainment with empathy and presenting great evidentiary arguments. Second, I have to cite FD Signifier again, because his video connecting the manosphere ends on a conclusion I feel similarly wound to in this video. If we recognize that there is a battle for the proliferation of certain ideas among this population, but we still see the massive influence and reach of everything between Gary Vee onto Jordan Peterson for men and boys, then to me that says that we aren't really putting our best foot forward to address this on the left. A video essayist, Macabre Storytelling, did a pretty awesome video on his experience with pickup artist communities. He bravely admitted that he had unironically spent some time in the community and then got out and while in, he noticed that most of the men were just normal men who were like him trying to get better at talking to women. He also noticed that all the 
although he could see the flaws in the community and that there were several great content creators who had done excellent breakdowns of why pickup artistry was bad, when it was time for him to find a better alternative to pickup artistry and Manosphere type content, a lot of these creators didn't have as much to offer. I'm not gonna say BreadTube or leftists need to do a better job addressing men. I don't see it as my place to do that. I think it's a pretty oversimplified way of saying things, especially from my position. But I do think it is productive for us to examine masculinity and the struggles of men under patriarchy. And it is productive for those of us who are willing to speak to men of all sorts and meet them where Jordan Peterson usually would, with the facts and logic about our world and the experiences that we know we have. It is important for us to platform the words of Bell Hooks because any man, no matter his current political indoctrination, can find healing and education in them. Just take note of the fact that right-wingers and left-wingers and centrists and apolitical folks are all willing to talk about how messed up it is that men are being conditioned and have been conditioned to live emotionless, to live repressing their emotions, to be unable to cry. There is a starting point for us to talk about hooks, to talk about patriarchy to talk about Kendrick and to talk about feminism. And I think it's also important to make these examinations in hip hop. I've never really partial to the approach of being like, well, look at these rap look at these terrible rappers and their terrible misogynistic ideas. Though I empathize and understand people going with that approach, I also feel like we are often missing the point of this systemic holy societal idea. And I'm never really down with individualizing problems that are affecting everybody. It's not 21 Savage's fault, <laughs> you know? For non-black people like myself, we have a responsibility to understand that hip hop is a black art form that expresses black people's realities. And we have to give it some respect and distance with that in mind. But we can still participate in it because we are still given the grace from black people to participate in it. We are not entitled to Kendrick Lamar's music, no matter how much capitalism incentivizes him to sell it to us. So as we do so, with respect, we can also analyze how masculinity is presented and addressed within hip hop, and then do our best to affect that in a positive way. Ultimately, hip hop, just like patriarchy, is not something that stands on its own, apolitical, as this easily defined space, ah, hip hop, and then there's politics. No, there's a political reality behind hip hop. The story and forms of hip hop are rooted in the struggles of black people under capitalist, imperialist, neoliberal patriarchy. The result is decades of art, media, language, events, technology, and more that we can all gain so much happiness, healing, and knowledge from. But along the way, we can't be too shy to address it sometimes with a critical lens, so long as that critical lens is productive. Because we can't deify hip hop or hip hop artists, no matter how much we love them. In Father Time, we see Kendrick Lamar perfectly embody this idea. A man considered a savior figure of hip hop, whose personality is glorified and whose ideas are considered conscious canon sometimes, is sitting in front of us, telling us that this personality and these ideas are fundamentally broken to the point that he is in desperate need of help, just like any of us with trauma. Faced with these realities, faced with this great trauma and brokenness at the hands of his father, his first step as a man in need of love is to tell us that he loves his father. This is his entryway toward growth and healing. Let's learn from that, even if we can't replicate it. Wherever it is each of us need to go, love can be our entryway too. Hey, if you like this video, feel free to send a coffee to me in the Ko-Fi or Ko-Fi link below. Uh, your donations are greatly appreciated. I got a Twitter account that you can follow and an Instagram account you can follow. Special thanks to Deny as always for editing the hell out of these videos and uh, stick around. Subscribe, like, leave a comment. Let me know your thoughts on Father Time, on patriarchy, on bell hooks, on masculinity, on my shirt. I got the buttons all the way buttoned out you can see like so much here because it's hot it's very hot in new york but you know we do what we do so uh yeah bye thanks